professor shall we start yeah almost we have reached 80 participants here that is 30 participants in the youtube live youtube channel we will start bro certainly i'm ready yeah okay uh, first we will give an introduction about you with the chair person and after that you can share your screen and you can start your presentation bro yeah thank you okay once again very good morning everyone so thank you for joining the third day of uh, international e workshop on science and technology of emerging materials organized by the department of science and humanities chettinad college of engineering and technology karur tamil nadu india today on the third day final day of this east m21 the first session will be handled by an eminent professor from uh, united states of america professor ira idil who is the Artist Lord Mark Professor, Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering Department, Standard School of Engineering, New York University, Brooklyn, United States of America. I would like to hand over the session to the session chair, Dr. J. Kavita Ma'am, who is the Associate Professor of Mathematics, Department of Science and Humanities, Chetna College of Engineering Technology, to chair the session. Ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Can you all see this? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, sir. Okay. So shall I start? Yeah, yes, bro. You are ready, bro. You can you can start. Yes, bro. You can start. Okay. Let me go on to and uh, let's see if I can pick laser pointer. And you can see this laser pointer too. Great. Yes, Prof. Uh, yes. 
Great. So thank you very much for, for having me. I very much appreciate uh, the opportunity to talk to you. Um, and uh, the title is a very ambitious title, uh, Increasing the Silicon Solar Cell Efficiencies Above Fundamental Limits. And uh, of course, the first disclaimer is that this hasn't been uh, done yet, but I'm going to tell you a story about one of the ways in which it can be done and our efforts uh, in uh, moving towards there. Um, this is a new area of research uh, in my group. I moved to New York University um, from the University of Minnesota, where I was a professor for uh, uh, 13 years, uh, just before the pandemic hit. So we've been moving the lab, trying to do this research um, at the same time. And uh, there is some light at the end of the tunnel and some success. This is my first talk on this topic. Uh, so you're the first one uh, who will be hearing about it. The work is done by my graduate students, Min Tran and uh, Ivor uh, Cleveland, who are my first two students at NYU. If any of the students would like to follow me on Twitter, uh, I am at Ire Idol. Um, and you can also link to me at LinkedIn. I typically uh, broadcast things uh, that has to do with uh, Journal of Vacuum Science and Technology publications and various thoughts and advice and, and things like that. So you're welcome to follow. Um, I wanna tell you about uh, where I am. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with New York City. I'm sorry about this grainy map, but I wanted to get a, about a, an interesting map of uh, New York, Manhattan as possible. Uh, so this is uh, Manhattan Island, one of the boroughs of uh, New York City it has five of them. And uh, New York University is scattered around uh, New York City. Uh, it has campuses in various places. The uh, central campus is by Washington Square, right about here. And that's also uh, where I uh, live. But um, I work on, in Brooklyn, um, one of the most diverse cities in the United States. Um, and uh, it, even though those arrows look kind of uh, far apart, it has its uh, benefits. So every morning um, I take, when it's not raining, I take that bridge across and walk from home to uh, work. And that's the view I have uh, from that, um, from that uh, bridge uh, every morning. I'll show you the view. It's really spectacular in the evening. Um, the NYU Tendon School of Engineering is in uh, downtown Brooklyn. Uh, these are the uh, buildings in our backyard um, where we uh, enjoy occasional uh, stroll and lunch. And this is the building that uh, I work at on the seventh uh, floor of this building. Seventh and eighth floors are the chemical engineering building. And at the end of the day, after I'm done, I take a walk back on the same bridge and uh, watch the sunset. I try to time it. Um, and that's the Brooklyn Bridge that you're looking at and the Manhattan uh, Island skyline. And there is the sun setting. And that's the topic of the talk is to how to harness the energy uh, of, of that sun uh, before it sets, of course. And um, we've learned how to do that, right? Uh, we have silicon solar cells um, and they dominate the market. Uh, so I think uh, you heard a great deal of fantastic talks on various types of materials um, for making solar cells perovskites, copper, zinc, tin, sulfide, uh, et cetera. And you've heard about the silicon solar cells, but really silicon solar cells dominate the uh, market, 95%. Uh, There's a little sliver of thin uh, films here, 5%, and everything else is kind of niche, organic solar cells and, and uh, thin films, even uh, SIGs. So silicon really uh, is dominating the market. There is, however, is one issue, and that is silicon solar cell efficiencies have stalled. Uh, they increased only by 2% in the last two decades. And there is a reason for that. That's because there is a fundamental limit called the Shockley-Kaiser limit, um, about 
And we're approaching that and things get difficult as one approaches that uh, fundamental limit. And this talk is about how to um, surpass that, uh, that limit. So I didn't quite uh, know who the audience is going to be and what the background is going to be. So there is a bit of a tutorial flavor at the beginning of this talk. I wanna get everything, um, all of us on the same um, wavelength, so to speak, uh, before we can talk about some details of the uh, research. So I'm going to tell you about uh, where the Shockley-Kaiser limit uh, comes from. You may or you may not have heard about it. But as you know, uh, you may know, solar cells work uh, based on the principle of exciting um, electron hole pairs across a conduction and uh, valence band gap. Um, and if you have a spectrum of energies of photons, uh, there are some possibilities. One is that the photon has energy less than the band gap, in which case uh, you don't use those photons. So some of the sun's energy we throw away. If it has the band gap energy, then it can create an electron hole pair, which can then be accelerated and uh, extracted as current. If the energy is greater than the band gap, then we excite hot electrons and holes, and those cool very rapidly by colliding with the lattice atoms um, and exciting phonons, which is basically heat, and that is energy lost as heat. So too large of a band gap <clears throat> will throw away too many of the photons. Too small of a band gap will lose too much energy to the heat given a solar spectrum. And there is a happy medium. And that happy medium um, it gives a maximum as a function of the band gap energy. And the happy medium lies actually somewhere around the band gap of crystal and silicon, 1.1, uh, 1.3 EV. And it's a rather broad maximum. And the maximum is about, uh, 33%. Uh, this is a bit of a dated slide. There are also records of various technologies plotted on here. Here, crystalline silicon is shown as 25%. Perovskite is shown as 20%, but we know that that's uh, basically rivaling crystalline silicon now. Um, and these are just uh, one semiconductor uh, band gap. CZTS is also higher. Organic is also higher. But generally, you know, you can't uh, surpass that, uh, that limit. Um, so that energy that goes to heat, that energy lost as heat, um, as the electrons relax to the band edges, is actually quite a lot. Um, here, here is that maximum, the usable electric power is underneath that. The pink here are the band gap photons that are uh, uh, photons with energies below the band gap. And this green here is the amount lost uh, as heat, relaxation to the band edges. And uh, that's quite a bit. Um, how to recover that uh, is a worthwhile thing to uh, think about. So one way to surpass that shockley coise limit is tandem solar cells. And um, there you cheat, instead of using a single semiconductor, you use a couple uh, or more semiconductors for multi-junction solar cells, where you uh, make use of the fact that the different band gaps absorb different parts of the spectrum. And using that way, you can increase the uh, efficiency and go beyond the shockley kaiser limit. For example, halite perovskite silicon tandem solar cells is one very viable way of uh, surpassing that limit. And people have been working towards that. And efficiency is ranging from 22% to record of 29.5% uh, by Oxford uh, PV have been, have been reported. And here is, uh, th there are different designs. <clears throat> and here is a um, couple designs over here uh, based on the perovskite and silicon. And in this particular case, the perovskite is form a medium cesium lead iodide bromide. It's a cocktail um, of halogens and organic and inorganic um, cations. Now, uh, one thing that you'll notice here is that it has many, many layers. And so this adds both complexity and cost, but definitely an exciting prospect to go after um, the Shockley-Kaiser limit. 
There is, however, another way, um, and that is quantum cutting. And let me describe what quantum uh, cutting is. Suppose you had a magic material that you could deposit on silicon solar cells, or any solar cell for that matter, um, and it can convert blue photons, ultraviolet photons, and blue photons to near-infrared photons with 200% quantum yield. That is, for every photon in the blue um, and um, uh, ultraviolet, you got two photons in the infrared. So you have this one photon coming into this material and very efficiently that material produces two photons, okay? If you could do that, you would then shave off uh, this part of the spectrum and put it into the near band gap uh, edge. And so this is, we term it spectrum shaping via quantum uh, cutting, okay? So that, uh, removes the losses to uh, relaxation to band edges, some of it, not all of it. Now, um, there's another benefit, and that is quantum cutting shifts absorption to wavelengths where the silicon solar cells are more efficient. So um, one way that we look at the efficiency is using the figure of merit called the uh, external quantum efficiency. That is the number of generated charges per number of incident uh, photons. So here um, uh, I plotted the spectrum. Uh, this is the solar spectrum, AM 1.5, it's normalized. And I also plotted a typical uh, external quantum efficiency for a silicon solar cell. Now the recombination decreases the, uh, the external quantum efficiency in the UV blue region. So you can see here that the EQE is taking a dive once we get into the blue uh, region. Quantum cutting shifts absorption to near infrared where the external quantum efficiency is closer to one. So here you see that in the blue, we have external quantum efficiency is less than 0.7, much smaller. On the other hand, in the uh, near infrared, quantum efficiencies are much higher nearing uh, one. And that of course is because near infrared uh, light can go deep into the silicon and absorb where recombination is low, whereas uh, ultraviolet and blue are uh, absorbed shallow where there are surfaces and the recombination is high. So quantum cutting by shifting the blue photons to infrared also gains um, in this uh, type of uh, recombination losses. So you not only can increase and surpass the Shockley-Kaiser limit, but also come closer to it um, than it had been possible with silicon. So there are two benefits. So you might say, well, how much can you increase the efficiency with, with this method? Well, you can calculate it. You can repeat the calculation that Shockley and Kaiser did <clears throat> back in the 1960s uh, with quantum cutting. And so here is the Shockley-Kaiser limit without quantum cutting in black. And here it is in red. Um, and here is the, uh, in purple, the current efficiency uh, about 26% or so. So not only raise the limit from 33 to something like 41%, uh, but also remember that we're pushing the absorption to places where external quantum efficiency is higher. So this purple dot can come closer to the red curve than it can, be, it can come close to the, uh, the, the black curve, okay? So if you do various calculations and estimations, 35% realistic commercial goal is not impossible. It is, it is really realistic, provided you can do this quantum cutting very efficiently with 200% efficiency. Now, immediately you might be wondering, well, this quantum cutting uh, device is going to emit isotropically. That is, it's going to emit in all directions and some of the light might escape um, the material and instead of going into silicon, go back out uh, of the cell. Uh, and that's true, but there's something working towards you. And that is the quantum cutting materials, the ones that we're talking about have high enough refractive indices that uh, the loss cone here is actually small. 
and the light is trapped by total internal reflection uh, inside that inside that film. So even without any optical tricks, if you take into account such losses, you still have um, a realistic chance of uh, increasing the efficiency uh, substantially. So do we have such a material? Well, this actually line of thinking is not new. Uh, people have been looking at it uh, since Dexter's paper in 1957 for 60 years, um, uh, but a material uh, has not been discovered with that type of efficiency. And except in 2017, um, a song at all in China serendipitously uh, runs into the magic material. And, you know, there's a lot of work going on in uh, halite perovskites uh, and, you know, people do curiosity experiments and uh, see what happens. And of course, China is big on uh, lanthanides and rare earths. So this group was studying what would happen if you put lanthanides into something like cesium lead chloride, a, a metal halide perovskite. So they were taking um, cesium lead chloride and doping it with, it with various lanthanides, including ytterbium, for example. And the idea is that the ytterbium substitutes or any of the lanthanides substitute into the lead position and dope it. And then they were looking at the emissions from various um, uh, rare earths. And so here, for example, uh, is samarium. Here is uh, uh, ytterbium. And the ytterbium emission you see here is very near the band gauge of uh, a silicon. And what they find is that, yes, most of the lanthanides have some efficiency, but they discover here that uh, ytterbium doped cesium lead uh, bromide gives um, a photoluminescence quantum yield in a near infrared of 140% uh, greater than 100%. So a sure sign of quantum cutting, okay? So since the discovery of this material, um, near 200% photoluminescence quantum yield has been achieved. Um, and in particular at the University of Washington, Gamlin's group, has published a series of uh, beautiful papers looking at this particular material, cesium lead chloride, as well as bromide variants, uh, looking at the mechanism and studying um, the ytterbium doping of nanocrystal dispersions, as well as films made out of those uh, nanocrystals. One issue is that uh, ytterbium emission saturates uh, with increasing light intensity. So you get 200% at low fluence and it decreases um, slowly. And that is problematic because here is the sun intensity. So there's low PLQI under AM 1.5 uh, conditions. So that's one problem. Putting in enough ytterbium doping is uh, difficult, particularly in colloidal synthesis. And ytterbium has a three plus valency, whereas in cesium lead chloride, uh, lead is two plus. So it doesn't like to go in as much although uh, the fact that um, it is a defect uh, may help the quantum cutting. At least that's one of the hypotheses. But uh, in any case, uh, this problem has to be solved if materials like this has to be, uh, can be, should be commercialized. So one might ask, well, what is the mechanism? How is this happening? And I can tell you that it's not understood, though there are hypotheses. And I'll tell you about one of them, probably the most credible one uh, by Gamelin's group. So one hypothesis invokes uh, ytterbium 3 plus induced defects uh, slightly below the conduction band edge. And the idea is that <clears throat> the uh, exciton is trapped by this ytterbium three plus induced defects, whatever that might be. And then uh, the en that energy, exciton energy is split and transferred into two um, ytterbium uh, ions. And the emission that you see here at 1000 uh, uh, nanometers, 1.25 electron volts is the doublet F uh, transitions uh, from an excited state to the ground state of uh, ytterbium. So how does this work? Well, uh, in the first step, so here's the absorption of the, that cesium lead chloride 
and here's the emission on this side. So what happens is that the blue light comes in, it gets absorbed, an electron hole pair forms. Then that electron hole pair gets trapped in a defect. Um, it, perhaps ethereum induced um, or not. And then when that um, trapped exciton recombines, it transfers the energy to two ethereum three plus, which then uh, relax and emit um, the infrared light, two photons. So that's the, and then you might say, well, um, you know, two ethereum have to be very close. The defect has to be very close. How does that work? Well, people have proposed a defect that looks something like this. This is the unit cell of the cesium lead chloride with the cesium atom in the center in green and the lead with the chlorine forming the octahedra. And you have corner to corner sharing octahedra. So imagine now three lead vacancies and then two of the lead vacancies get filled by ethereum three plus ions. So you have a charge compensation. Three lead vacancies give you six plus, two ethereum give you the six plus back and the vacancy is left. So the idea is that perhaps this vacancy traps that exciton um, and then two ethereum uh, are close by and the exciton transfers energy to the two ethereum. That's the hypothesis. So, we started asking, are there other quantum cutting materials? In, in particular, are there uh, lead-free quantum cutting materials? Is the, that particular defect really specific or would any defect near two ethereum ions would do? So uh, beyond going cesium lead chloride, we started looking at cesium bismuth perovskites. And of course, bismuth is non-toxic. So that's one reason to go there. And it's an alternative where now bismuth three plus and ethereum three plus are isovalent. So you might be able to put more ethereum into the uh, system. And it's also a test for whether this defect, um, charge compensated defect is necessary or would any defect do like a bismuth vacancy. So there are um, possibly four different uh, compounds that you can make with cesium, bismuth, and bromine. And we've been making um, all of these. Some are more stable than others. Um, and you, the ratio of cesium, to brom cesium bromide to bismuth bromide uh, increases from something like cesium-3, bismuth, bromine-6 to, on this end, a uh, bismuth-rich uh, compound. Um, I'm going to talk about, I don't know why that is so huge and it's not showing, um, but um, I'm going to talk about two of these structures, uh, a trigonal uh, cesium bismuth bromide and a monoclinic cesium bismuth bromide. Although there is uh, some disagreement about whether it's really monoclinic or not. And I'm sorry that this structure is not showing. Uh, hopefully it'll show in later, um, later slides. So we deposit these using reactive physical vapor deposition via co-evaporation of the precursors. I call it reactive physical vapor deposition because we physically evaporate the salts, but upon landing on the substrate, they react. Uh, so it's not physical vapor deposition like you would do to metals there's a reactive component to it. Inside that, um, so we have a uh, PVD chamber that's glow boxed and inside it, there are six sources and each with independent quartz crystal micro balances and a combinatorial mask that allows us to look at uh, really rapidly various compositions. So we can move this mask, these knife edges over samples either discreetly or continuously to put gradients or deposit matrices of three by three or four by four samples um, and produce libraries of various um, uh, compositions. 
I'm just going to focus on this cesium bismuth bromide doped with ethylbium uh, compound. Um, there are other uh, materials that we're pursuing uh, using this approach, but I will just pick uh, this one and show you some results. The position temperature for the uh, data that I'm going to discuss is about 30 degrees centigrade, so it is low. And the reason for that is bismuth bromide has a very high vapor pressure. Um, and so um, it will, um, at, at higher temperatures, uh, uh, will not stick to the substrate, uh, although we're trying some high deposition temperatures. Typical film thicknesses are 400, 400 500 nanometers. Uh, deposition rates are uh, uh, a few angstroms uh, per second. And we do post annealing, typically temperatures ranging from 200 to 300 degrees centigrade, at least for the experiments that I'm going to talk about. The advantages here of this approach is that <clears throat> we can use combinatorial approach. It's solvent free. Stoichiometry control is uh, very good. We have high reproducibility and uniform films. And uh, here are my students, Ivor and Min, uh, who are the co-authors here, whose work that I'm, uh, I'm discussing. So the first thing I want to take a little detour. Um, and when you're looking at a material that hasn't been studied too much, as opposed to something like cesium lead chlorides and bromides, um, there are some roadblocks that you enter. Um, for example, published absorption and photoluminescence data very significantly uh, in this particular material, cesium-3, bismuth-2, bromine-9, trigonal system. And all approaches have used uh, solution-based methods, and they have all in common that they use bismuth bromide and oleic acid in various solvents. And if you look at this here, you know, this absorption data is presumably coming from the same material. And so your first impression might be, well, you know, there are nanocrystals and uh, there are dispersions. So maybe there's quantum confinement effects that is shifting the absorption uh, to the blue uh, direction, okay? And I can tell you that the blue shift is not due to quantum confinement because there's no clear trend with nanocrystal size. I will give you an example. Uh, here is this one um, at around 440 and it's for from three nanometer nanocrystals. And here's one that's larger um, and 20 nanometers, but it's coming blue shifted. So if it was indeed quantum confinement, these two should have been uh, reversed. And there are others that don't miss the trend. And there you notice sort of a, a lumping of around 380, 390 nanometers and a lumping around uh, 430 uh, nanometers. There's one interesting fact that I would like to point out. If you make a liquid solution of bismuth bromide, BIBR6 three minus ions, they also absorb at 386 nanometers. So if you just make, there are no nanocrystals or solids here, it's just an ionic solution. And that absorption is this dashed line here that was collected back in 1993 by Oldenburg. And note that it is almost identical to some of these absorption spectra. That's presumably cesium-3, bismuth-2, bromine-9 uh, colloids. Um, so the absorption peak locations vary from 383 to about 435 nanometers. Photoluminescence is also the same. So here is photoluminescence coming from that material and it's all over the place. Again, that you cannot uh, explain this by quantum confinement. There is no clear trend with the nanocrystal size. There's huge difference in the photoluminescence quantum yield reported for these materials, all the way from 0.2% to 46.4% by Ma et al. And most people uh, quote this value to justify that this could be, for example, a material that you can make blue LEDs from, okay? So what does optical absorption from the physical vapor deposited films look like? And here is the cesium-3 bismuth uh, bromine-9. This is the trigonal. And here is the, um, the other monoclinic uh, structure. And I want to point out a couple of things here. One is that if you look at the octahedra here, even though it's not obvious from all of them, they're all corner to corner connected. So there are no isolated octahedra here. 
Whereas on this material, the monoclonic material, the octahedra are isolated. They're almost like quantum dots, if you will, of octahedra. Um, and, and I should also point out that this looks a lot like BIBR6 ions floating in a liquid. Okay, they're not interacting. So here's our, uh, the absorption data from our physical vapor deposited films. And you see uh, peaks corresponding to 383 nanometer that's coming from this material, from the monoclinic uh, phase. And an absorption peaking at 435 nanometer coming from the material that is uh, corner to corner uh, connected, okay? Um, these are slightly uh, saturated uh, films. And if you deposit thin films, you see the peaks clearly here. So the optical absorption here is a little bit saturated, um, but that's okay. So this 383 nanometer, which is also where the ion in a liquid is absorbing, and here it is coming from uh, a solid, the, the same uh, absorption. And then it's shifted when these octahedra start interacting with each other to 435 uh, nanometer. We assign those absorption peaks to transitions localized on the metal ion in nearly isolated um, BIBR63 uh, octahedra. By the way, I'm just noticing that I don't know if there are questions. Um, I can take questions during clarification or at the end. I am not quite sure uh, what is the preferred way. Okay, there are a number of, I just noticed that in the chat uh, questions, um, uh, perhaps I can take them at the, at the, at the very end at, at once. And I see that there are very, there are very good questions. Okay, so I'll just continue, but hold on to your questions. Okay, so uh, there are no chances of contamination here in the PVD films from anything in the liquid or from the uh, ions. Okay, so one of the things that I already pointed out is that this structure looks like a liquid solution of BIBR6 uh, octahedra, right? So if you looked at this, if I took away these lines that are telling you where the unit cell is, it might as well be a schematic of a liquid solution of BIBR6 that is solvated by the cesium uh, ions. And indeed, here is that solid absorption, and here is the liquid absorption in blue. They're right on, on top of each other. So these are really uh, 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 acting like isolated octahedra. When you connect them and they start interacting a little bit, that absorption shifts to 435. And um, bismuth ions form complexes with anions, bromine, for example, and ligands in solvent molecules. And we've been able to um, basically obtain, um, you, you know, optical absorption spectra in various solvents that looks a lot like what has been reported for uh, cesium-3, Bi-2, Br-9. So we think that the reported absorptions are from bismuth complexes and, and, and from the, uh, the impurity phase, monoclinic phase, cesium-3, Bi, Br6, and not from the trigonal cesium-3, Bi2, Br9. In fact, um, we did this with photoluminescence. Uh, the blue shifted photoluminescence previously attributed to quantum confinement in colloidal cesium-3, Bi2, Br9 nanocrystals. We could reproduce them with just Bi, Br6 solutions in solvent without any monocrystals present, uh, both in line shape and in location, and here they are. So these are six different papers. All we did was digitize their data and normalize it, and then go and make their solvents and um, put the ligands that they used in there, excited at the same wavelength as uh, they did, and we can reproduce the line shapes, and there are no quantum dots in our solutions. So we think that there is uh, a lot of uh, misinterpretation um, of uh, photoluminescence and absorbance data. 
In particular, for example, that is the 46.4% for luminescence quantum yield from a supposed CS cesium-3 Bi2 Br9. Um, okay. So absorbance and PL from our PVD deposited films, no matter what we do, we typically get an absorption peak at 433 nanometers. The absorption onset is, is at uh, 400, 466 nanometers. That's about 2.66 electron volts, exactly where one would like it to be uh, for quantum cutting, twice 1.25 EV, the terbium transition. Um, we observe photoluminescence at 472 nanometers, but it's weak. Um, you know, it's immeasurable in a um, integrating sphere. Um, PL lifetime is less than one uh, nanosecond. And if you throw away uh, all the data that is suspect and photoluminescence quantum yield that is suspect, the highest trustable photoluminescence quantum yield in the literature is actually 0.2%. So uh, whether this uh, material emits very efficiently is certainly uh, in doubt, at least in the, in the visible. Um, I should also say that we made a lot of, uh, I didn't talk about this, but we also made a lot of oleic acid solutions with very high photoluminescence quantum yield with the quantum yield, depending on who you get the oleic acid from and what the impurities are. So the message here is that one has to be very, very careful in doing uh, optical measurements here. So I wanna get back to my story here. So I told you a lot about this uh, optical uh, absorption, but the fact that this material has low photoluminescence quantum yield in the visible is important, okay? Um, now, the materials that I talked about within the limitations of X-ray diffraction and Raman spectroscopy are phase pure, okay? And so if you do uh, X-ray diffraction, we see only uh, the tetragonal uh, cesium-3, bismuth-2, bromine-9 uh, peaks. Um, it turns out that Raman spectroscopy is particularly useful in differentiating whether you have uh, any impurity phases. So I compare here the Raman from our thin films of cesium-3, bismuth-2, bromine-9, the trigonal uh, phase, and here is the monoclinic phase, and you can clearly see that there are peaks that are absent in the uh, trigonal phase. And if there is any unreacted bismuth bromine uh, in there, that should also give uh, some unique peaks that should appear here, um, uh, but it doesn't. So our, our films, as far as we can tell, uh, don't have these uh, impurities. So I wanna get back to the quantum cutting. Uh, so I started introducing this material and I said, well, could, it, could this be a quantum cutting uh, material? Is it a candidate? So we took this material and we doped it with ethereum. Um, and so making films, if you will, uh, assuming that ethereum goes into the bismuth position, uh, basically alloys or solid solutions of bismuth and uh, ethereum. So we added increasing amounts of ethereum bromine, uh, bromide, to co-deposition with cesium bromide and bismuth bromide. And I'm going to report in the rest of this talk percent ethereum as ethereum um, per bismuth, that is uh, per bismuth locations, okay? So 50% ethereum means half the bismuth um, is, um, uh, is approximately half the bismuth is, is replaced by ethereum. So as you can see here is that the X-ray diffraction, uh, the only peaks that you get are the tetragonal, uh, the trigonal um, cesium-3 um, bismuth or ethereum-2 uh, bromine-9. Uh, there is texturing. So the polycrystalline data uh, diffraction peak distribution is different than um, the, our film, so there is some texturing, but up to 50% ethereum, uh, you don't see any additional peaks. Uh, there is some changes in the different uh, in the intensity distributions, and there is no shift in the um, in the diffraction peaks. So it remains a tetragonal CS3 Bi2 Br9 at least up to 50% ethereum. Hypothesis is that ethereum three plus substitutes for bismuth three plus. 
we detect ethereum with the um, EDS and it increases with the ethereum. There is a difficulty with ethereum and uh, bromine interfering with each other in the EDS spectrum. So you can't be definitive, um, but there is ethereum. And um, we think that uh, ethereum does indeed substitute for bismuth, at least uh, some of them, because in the Raman peak, as you can see, you see a shift and you see broadening. And so the broadening you would expect as you make more heterogeneous the locations of the, <clears throat> um, the bismuth bromine vibrations. So for example, if you substitute in ethereum for some of them, uh, uh, this bismuth bromine vibration, for example, would be different than one where it's not near an ethereum substituted uh, octahedra. Um, in addition, we see two additional broad peaks appearing with ethereum, which we attribute to the ethereum uh, bromide vibrations at 290 and 400 uh, wave numbers. UVV absorption um, of this ethereum doped uh, films, there is very little change, very little shift um, with ethereum doping. And um, So this, you know, remembering that the connectedness of the octahedra affects the location of that peak. This means that the, uh, the octahedra are still corner to corner uh, connected. And uh, one thing that I noticed is that there is a weak absorption at 383 nanometer for films with greater than 30% ethereum. So this could be due to uh, bismuth bromide um, excess bismuth bromide showing up um, at, at, that, at that location. So the question is, do these films emit in the near infrared? So first visible emission, they do emit in the 472 nanometers. So the visible emission is there, but the photoluminescence quantum yield is, is too low. So very fast non-radiative recombination, uh, less than one on a second lifetime, uh, faster than uh, we, can, we can measure. So there are lots of defects and they are um, non-radiatively recombining the excitons, okay? But surprisingly strong near infrared emission at 1000 nanometer, where we would expect. And in fact, you can quantify for luminescence quantum yield it increases with increasing ethereum, and the highest we get with these films is 14.5% from the 30% ethereum doped uh, cesium 3 bismuth 2 bromine 9 film. So, something really fast is able to compete with non radiative recombination. Um, and so, this radiative re mechanism is introduced with ethereum uh, and it competes with the non radiative relaxation. One thing that I didn't say is that the quantum cutting in cesium lead uh, uh, chloride is very fast. So uh, this is a, uh, an encouraging sign. It's not over hundred uh, percent, but certainly by putting interview in there, we have a fast uh, energy transfer mechanism. Is this emission via quantum cutting? A question. So um, what we did next was to add iodine to decrease the band gap of the ethereum doped uh, films. So we're in essence now making uh, bromide iodide of the ethereum doped cesium bismuth uh, halide. And the hypothesis is that if the mechanism is quantum cutting, the near uh, infrared photoluminescence quantum yield should decrease rapidly when the band gap is less than two and a half electron volts, right? Because it takes 1.25 EV per um, ethereum and if one reduces the band gap less than two and a half EV, then one doesn't have enough energy to excite uh, the two ethereum in tandem. And in fact, that's what's observed with the cesium lead chloride material. So this is data from the Gamelin's group where they did the same thing here, except they were working with cesium lead chloride and they added bromide to shift the band gap. And when the band gap fell below two and a half EV, the photoluminescence intensity uh, went to uh, went to very low and zero. So then the idea is that you reduce the uh, band gap to get uh, to see if the 
uh, near IRPLQI goes to zero. Okay, so that's the experiment that we're going to do. We're going to shift the band gap by substituting iodine for bromine. So the conduction band gap is going to come down. Uh, as a result, you can't excite the ytterbium and the near IR emission stops. So we did that. Uh, so now we have four precursors, cesium iodide, cesium bromide, bismuth bromide, and ytterbium uh, bromide. And we went from zero to 34% uh, iodine in the bromine positions. And X-ray diffraction shows uh, that uh, iodine is substituted. We don't see any uh, sign of phase uh, um, separation. So I, I don't know if you can see, but those dashed lines are actually uh, sloped. So the peak is actually shifting uh, to lower to theta because iodine is bigger and the unit cell is expanding. So the trigonal structure is retained at least up to 34%. Uh, with no sign of uh, phase separation. Absorption peak broadens and redshifts as uh, one would expect from uh, the peak goes from 433 nanometers to 490 from 286 to 2.5 EV. There is broadening. We think that's possibly due to band edge fluctuations. That is the iodine and bromide while not completely phase separated uh, there's fluctuations as you uh, as there is uh, distribution of iodine and bromine, um, and the absorption onset for 34% uh, film is less than two and a half electron uh, electron volts. So indeed, when uh, one increases the iodine and shifts the band gap, the uh, near IR PLQI decreases from 14 and a half percent to 1% uh, almost uh, non-existent. Um, so I don't have much time left. I want to summarize and conclude some things and tell you where we're going. Um, so first, efficient quantum cutting, I think, is a, a realistic uh, way. If one can get um, to realistic photon fluxes and, and retain 200% uh, photoluminescence quantum yield, I think it's a viable way to improve silicon solar cell efficiencies beyond the Kaiser limit to nearing 40%, even uh, exceeding 40%. So I think uh, this is exciting, uh, exciting time. It hasn't been possible before. Um, so we're, we're proposing uh, as one material, uh, cesium-3 bismuth bromide as a lead-free host material for ytterbium doping that may exhibit quantum cutting. We resolved discrepancies in the reported optical absorption and photoluminescence uh, for this material. And in particular, one has to be careful because uh, bismuth uh, bromide in solution, the ion itself emits and may be misinterpreted. I didn't show you this data, but oleic acid emits really strongly and may be misinterpreted. So not everything emission in the blue that one sees is a quantum dot. Um, and moreover, cesium-3 bismuth Br6 uh, is an impurity phase that may also emit at 383 nanometers and may be misinterpreted. Um, and we're confident that the absorptions in the photoluminescence that we are reporting for the PVD films are uh, for the cesium-3 uh, Bi2 Br6. Incidentally, all of that agree with single crystals, which is work that was done uh, way back in the 1980s. We doped this material with ytterbium and achieved 14.5% near infrared PLQI, and that's the uh, highest uh, of um, these lead free materials in terms of photoluminescence quantum yield. Uh, we think that the ytterbium, at least some of it, substitutes into the ytterbium bismuth positions. Uh, and there is a fast energy transfer from the uh, cesium 3 bismuth to bromide bands to ytterbium three plus ions that can compete with non-radiative recombination. And it's only present when the band gap is greater than two and a half electron volt. So could it be quantum cutting? It is still a, an open question. And um, make no mistake, I did not show at all that this was quantum cutting. The definitive way to show is to improve the photoluminescence quantum yield to greater than uh, 100. Uh, percent. The uh, question that remains is whether this material 
is worth optimizing to try to uh, get there or whether there are other uh, materials. So with that, I'm going to conclude. I think I went a little over my time, uh, but I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor, for the enlightening lecture. Should I take the chat questions one by one? Yeah, yes, yes, Professor. Shall I read it at the... Uh... So, may, did you want to read or do you want me to go ahead and uh, take these? I can read them. Yeah, yes, okay, Professor. I will read the question. Uh, one question uh, asked by Prachi Desai. Uh, his question is why silicon solar cell are more efficient when there is absorption shift wavelength? So um, there are a couple things. One is that there's two reasons. One is that when the absorption shifts to near infrared and absorbed at to the near band edges, one does not lose the energy that the higher electron might have as it falls to the band edges. So if you come with a blue light and excite the electron to a higher energy level, that electron quickly collides with the lattice to lose its energy and goes to the conduction band edge. And that energy is lost as heat. If I could take that energy and make a second photon with energy just at the conduction band edge, then I save that energy. So that's one reason for efficiency. The second reason is that the absorption is shipped to near infrared and that light is absorbed deeper in the silicon where the recombination of uh, electron hole pairs is uh, low recombination rate. Um, if the light is absorbed in the ultraviolet, then uh, the absorption is closer to interfaces near the surface where the recombination is high. So the uh, external quantum efficiency goes down. And thank you, Professor. And the second question asked by the same participant. Uh, when you said electron trapped due to ytterbium 3 plus defect, does that lead electron to go in metastable state? That is correct. It goes to uh, an excited metastable state. That um, uh, excited state has a very long lifetime. It's on the order of milliseconds, sometimes tens of milliseconds. Okay, and uh, thank you, Prof. And that question asked by the participant Nisha Prakash. Uh, her question is, uh, uh, bismuth is non-toxic. How to find out the toxicity of the material? Ah, that is a good question. And there are, uh, it is uh, beyond my expertise, that, but there are researchers who uh, look at uh, the toxicity of uh, various elements or various compounds um, by various methodologies, uh, you know, looking at the uh, cells, for example, when certain concentrations of these things are um, given. Uh, so I am merely reporting something that is known for bismuth. Uh, it's uh, something not, not toxic, uh, but uh, my simple answer is that I Google it. <laughs> Okay, okay, that's for And uh, another question asked by uh, Bindya De. Uh, his question is, is it possible to use the doping materials in medicine field for treatment? Is it possible to use the doping materials in medicine field for treatment? That is an intriguing question. I didn't think about the applications of, for example, near infrared uh, emission uh, uh, whether uh, that can be used in the medical field. It's outside my expertise, I'm afraid, but uh, it is uh, a, a material that uh, luminesces in the infrared when excited in blue. So I don't know, maybe some of you will be very smart enough and find an application. Okay, uh, thank you, Prof. And uh, one of the participants would like to have a discussion with you. Certainly. Uh, yeah. Um, hello. Yes, I'm here. 
Yes, proceed. Hello. Proceed. Hello, Professor Ire. Uh, thank you very much for this wonderful uh, lecture and uh, for clearing out the basics and the mechanisms behind uh, how these uh, solar cells can work. So I have a, a bit of a broad question. Maybe it's not exactly about this talk, but I was thinking, uh, how about the possibility of having like a graded system where we can have like differently doped silica and then create like a spectrum of band gaps and then have correspondingly like a graded uh, quantum cutting so that we can, you know, hit uh, uh, like a higher efficiency. That's a wonderful question and a wonderful idea. And that would be, um, so uh, if, you, if you recall, I showed this plot where this, there was this sort of huge green gap between mm -hmm. some really high efficiency and where we are. And that right. was like, you know, something like 30%. Then I came out and said modestly, okay, we're going to get, you know, maybe another 10%. So then the question uh -huh. is, where is the other 20% going, right? Uh -huh. So that's great. But so by taking everything above 500 nanometers and bringing it to 1,000 nanometers, I did something. But there's all these other photons where, uh, yeah. you know, yeah. 500 nanometers, uh -huh. 600 nanometers, they're losing the energy. What are we going to do with those? So uh -huh. your suggestion is, can we put a cocktail of these uh, yeah. and then have them emit? And that would be wonderful to think about which, um, which transitions do we want to couple into and so on. So our understanding of the mechanism right now and the control is so rudimentary that the ethereum, what I just described in various materials is what I would consider walking before we can run. But certainly the possibility, I hope the possibility that you're suggesting exists and that we will learn more and more about the fundamentals of this so that we can design a material like that you're describing. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I, yeah, thank you for the explanation. Participants, do you have any questions? If please type in the chat box or else if you want to discuss with the speaker, please use the raise hand option. We will allow you to interact with the speaker. If anybody would like to have a uh, discussion with the speaker, please use the option raise hand. Okay, Prof. Uh, thank you very much. Thank, thank you so much for the wonderful lecture, even though in the, uh, in this, uh, in the middle of your night. I think it's, thank you very uh, much for having me. There. Yeah, thank you so much, Prof. Uh, we will look forward to, see, forward to seeing in our campus very soon. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you for bye -bye. having me. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.